morning friends and welcome back to NPTEL online certification course on Indian poetry in English. Presently, we are actually dealing with Indian English diasporic poets and if uh, you remember well, we are discussing A. K. Rama Nujan, one of the most celebrated, widely known, widely anthologized poet of all times. Not only an Indian poet, but an Indian English diasporic poet who created his niche in the front galleries of Indian English poets. In the previous lecture, as I had promised you that only one lecture cannot suffice or cannot do justice to the poetic credibility or the poetic credo of A. K. Ramanujan. And that is why in the second part, we shall be discussing if uh, we can connect well. The previous lecture had ended on the note of a poem entitled Snakes. And you might be quite familiar that snakes like insects, many animals, birds, natural objects like rivers and many other things which A. K. Ramanujan had formed association with during his childhood, they actually become a subject of his poetic canvas. And in this lecture, we shall be discussing how when he writes poems even on nature or natural aspects, he does not have only nature in his mind, rather he talks of some other things as well, my dear friend. So, the poem that we are going to start with in this second lecture is Rivers. In one poem after another, you can find A. K. Ramanujan talking of several things through his poem. Again, we can take another poem, River. No, a river, once again, he actually tries to look at the contraries of the river. I mean, poets after poets have gone to adore river, its flow, its movements and what not. But the poet also looks at, I mean, the poet in Ramanujan looks at the other side of it, even though you can worship. I mean, the poet says, in Madurai, the poem is titled The River. I will simply take up some of the lines. In Madurai city of temples and poets who sang of cities and temples every summer, the poet actually waited to see the river in flood. And you know, the poets were actually uh, full of admiration for the river. River dries to a trickle in the sand, bearing the sand reeves. Straw and women's here, clogging the water gates at the rusty bars, under the bridges with patches of repair all over them. When there is a flood, uh, there are all sorts of squalor, there are all sorts of things in the river and the poets actually get a sort of inspiration. No? The poets only sang of the floods. But now the poet A. K. Ramanujan, what he says is actually very significant and very meaningful. What he says is, he was there for a day. When they had the floods, people everywhere talked of the inches rising, the precise number of cobbled steps run over by the water rising on the bathing places. But can you really think of what harm did the river did? And then, and the way it carried off three village houses, the sort of destruction. We have talked of uh, these uh, a river as a sort of benediction for many people and the poets have been singing of its glory only. But my dear friends, have they ever thought of the damage that the river has done of carried of three villages and pregnant woman and a couple of cows named Gopi and Brinda as usual. So, the, uh, there is actually a dig. There is actually a satiric remark, a sort of ironic. The new poets still quoted the old poets, but no one spoke in verse of the pregnant woman drowned with perhaps twins in her, kicking at blank walls even before birth. Could you ever see 
these poets who are simply talking of admiration of the river, could they really think of the damage that was done to a new generation which a woman was having, the pregnant woman who was having twins in her own uh, home and that could not come to life? It carries away in the first half hour. It is hardly uh, half an hour that everything can be destroyed. No, Gopi and Brinda and one pregnant woman expecting identical twins with no moles on their bodies with different colored diapers. So the poet here actually becomes very realistic. He does not have much. Uh, you know, scope for the imagination as many poets have for the rivers. Rather, he becomes very realistic, very scientific and says that could we really also think of the malign aspects of the river that actually took away the lives of a new generation that was there uh, in shape or in formative stage. Now, poet after poet and critics after critics have gone to the extent of saying that Ramanujan was a poet who actually associated himself only with family uh, memories, past rituals and all. Here is another poet, obituary. There also you can uh, find a flash of the remembrance of his own father and where he says how and this, this, this can be interpreted in several ways also. Father, when he passed on, left dust on a table of papers, left debts and daughters, a bedwetting grandson named by the toss of a coin after him. I mean, in Indian tradition, it so happens that there are many things that actually depend only upon the father. And the father, when the father goes for a profession or things for a livelihood, I mean, here there is actually a subtle remark on those people who are struggling for their own identity and what they leave behind because they are actually to think of the welfare of them and for that it becomes a sort of helplessness. And then the poet says, because this is a poem entitled Obituary, where the poet says, ears on a bent coconut tree in the yard burning the burning type, he burned properly at the cremation. As before easily and both hands left his eye coins in the asses that did not look one bit different, several spinal discs rough some burned to coal for sons. When the funeral uh, mm, uh, function takes place, how all these are left only in the asses and the last one what uh, the poet says is very painful. To pick gingerly and throw as the priest said, facing east where three rivers met near the railway station, no long standing headstone with full name and two dates. So, this is what all the relations simply come to an end and then there is only a ritual where the priest simply tells you uh, to look towards the way, uh, towards the uh, east and throw the asses because you are a son. And then towards the end, no, but someone told me he got two lines in an inside column. There is an obituary column in most of the newspapers. And with that, there comes to the end of a long you know, filial relationship between the son and the father. And you know what happens? All my father's memories and reminiscences are simply sold to, to whom? Only to the groceries where, you know, I buy salt, coriander, jaggery in newspaper cones that I usually read. For fun and lately in the hope of finding these obituary lines and he left us a changed mother and more than one annual ritual. So how this relation, no, these relations well, with the end of somebody's life, you know, it simply remains a memory and every year. So, in a way the poet you know, says that everywhere we remember them just once only and this is how the relations come to an end. So, the poem obituary, though we all are familiar with the meaning of the word obituary and it is written on his father's death, but it has actually got many other things also to address. If we take a minute observation of the lines of the poems as we have been doing, you will find out that it is not only about poet's father, but actually it talks about a tradition, how in Indian contexts there have been people, I mean the chief of the family or the head of the family who actually 
is by default the guardian of the family when he leaves or bids adieu to this earthly world. He actually leaves so many things and the poet has beautifully and very ironically commented upon when he says when he passed on left dust. We can have a look at the images left dust on a table of papers left debts and daughters. You can also find uh, the use of literary device assonance uh, debt daughters dust meaning thereby these are actually the images that the father left this world but then what did he leave nothing except dust debt daughters and also a bed waiting grandson. I mean father when he passed away he actually left for the, the son so many responsibilities which in Indian contexts has been many people often call it a sort of taboo. The uh, son is often burdened with the debts of the father and here also we find and not only this the poet actually portrays the father in such a light manner at times we can also consider the father has been portrayed here in a very miserable uh, way. The house is also not in a good, good condition. The house actually rested only on a coconut tree in the yard and being the burning type, look at the word being the burning type, the father always used to be angry and you know anger was considered to be a sort of you know when, when uh, elders in the house become angry, the elders always expected a sort of respect and they always consider themselves to be the provider of everything. And then as the poem progresses we can find that not only the death of the father left everybody in a very difficult situation in a, in a, in a moment of despair, but then the poet also makes a comment on the priest who simply says that the ashes of the departed soul have to be uh, thrown, have to be thrown facing east to where three rivers met near the railway station, no long standing headstone with his full name and two dates. With his full name and two dates. I mean this is actually the tradition, the poet being in the US, now when the poet has gathered a lot of knowledge and seen more and more of the world, then when he looks back and he finds that what a sort of legacy we Indians have got. So the father has been portrayed even though it is a sort of obituary, but at the same time it actually refers to so many realities. The father's passing away may be a shock to many, but to the poet, the poet simply says like his Sigerian birth in a Brahmin ghetto, the tradition that goes well and his death by heart failure in the fruit market. So like any other uh, ailment, the father also suffered a heart attack, but someone told me he only left two lines in an inside column, meaning thereby the death of the father was simply mentioned in a newspaper column and then that way uh, the poet also makes actually a caricature of how death is very you know death is very insignificant and at the same time death, death is a sort of celebration in Indian context. But then that, that death is recorded only in a newspaper column and that is that is not a, a, a sort of sacrament rather and even though it is a sacrament it is given only a little space and the same paper where the son actually wants to look for in order to celebrate uh, the death of a father and in order to reminisce uh, the death of the father he simply finds that like many other newspapers which are often used in the grocery store simply are uh, to uh, buy things and simply to sell things meaning thereby that in a context like India where life and death you know where life and death are very important. We have already learnt in the previous uh, lecture 
how snakes are important and you know snakes actually symbolize fertility uh, snakes also symbolize rebirth because when the snake actually leaves or sheds its own sludge it actually refers to a sort of continuity of life so in india even these stones are celebrated but here uh, the the sun actually uh, makes a very satirical uh, comment here and says that i usually read for fun and lately in the hope of finding these obituary lines and he left us the last lines are actually uh, very shocking surprising and then uh, there is a sort of pathos and suffering as well and the suffering is not for the father because the father could not do anything all around his life throughout his life uh, he, he, he did not have much to leave but then what father a uh, father's passing away left was and he left us a changed mother and more than one annual ritual the mother not only became a widow but then it simply became after the demise of the father only once a year it became an annual ritual to celebrate uh, like the anniversary you know death anniversary being celebrated every year so my dear friends while uh, the writer uh, while the poets concerned towards his father may, might have been uh, uh, depicted in a very light hearted manner but then the poet also shows his own propensity and his own closeness towards his mother his affinity his sympathy for his mother it, it, it we have always uh, seen uh, in some of the essays and some of the poems uh, that uh, uh, the poet uh, ramanujan was very close to his mother in one of the poems he has mentioned that when he was living for the usa the mother did not have too many words to say the mother was simply silent and at times the poet also reminisces how the mother was rather gathering uh, the rice grains which had fallen on the floor so mothers are often uh, most often rather they are very submissive very humble and the tenderness of the mother actually uh, pains the poet in uh, uh, pains the poet in ak ramanujan so while thinking of his mother and once you know after a long time when he returns to india then suddenly after years and years uh, then suddenly he thinks of his own mother and then uh, the lines that he composed they are actually soaked uh, in molten tears uh, the yearning of a son for his mother who who is no more uh, the poet writes in the famous uh, poem entitled returning returning home one blazing afternoon he looked for his mother everywhere as a child you know the poet always used to look for his mother everywhere and all of the children you know they are habituated to look for their mother uh, quite often but he says she wasn't in the kitchen she wasn't in the backyard she wasn't anywhere he looked and looked grew frantic looked even under the beds where he found old shoes and dust balls but not his mother he ran out of the house shouting amma so we can find here uh, a, a sort of suffering of the poet a sort of anguish of the poet because long after when the poet returns what he finds to his great shock and surprise and to his grow great pain and misery that mother is no more the mother's memories are there and what are the mother's memories mother is not found in any corner neither in the backyard uh, nor in the baranda she was not anywhere only uh, under the bed he could find the shoes and the dust balls so the poet's association with his mother was actually so strong that every now and then he felt he felt for his mother and when he comes back to his shock he finds that the mother is no more suddenly he comes to realize oh his mother passed away too long and had he not missed his mother had he not lost his mother for all those years when he had been living in the us so 
time and again we find that majority of uh, the poems of A. K. Ramanujam, they are actually you know soaked in Indian memory, but then there is a fusion also of Indian and European literary traditions we will find, fine. There are actually allusions to his own traditions and custom, but then we can find irony and ironic symbols, use of everyday diction in majority of his poems. But then the Striders alone is not his collection. We can also find some other uh, poems from some uh, other collections, namely Relations, which was the second collection by him. Here again you can find that this is soaked actually in Hindu uh, mythological stories, customs, rituals and myth. It is this, this one uh, Relations appears to be uh, a bit maturer than the first one, where the poet actually uh, provides many poems which depict truth and non-violence. Some of the poems namely three are that uh, I would like to introduce here. One is one, two, maybe three arguments against suicide. Here the poet also becomes realistic and uh, draws inspiration uh, from the ancient sacred texts. And here he says that when a man commits suicide, one thing is there that is he commits suicide for a desire. And then this desire can be a passion as well. And if a man wants to have a life full of uh, calmness, quietness, perspicuity and all, I mean he should be free from the passions that is karma. And that is why in, in one of the poems, uh, which he says one, two, maybe three arguments against suicide, what he tells, he actually gives a reference to uh, the story of the Kamadev, isn't it? The story of the Kamadev. And then he says, remember what the wise, callous Hindus said when the love God burned, keep your cool, make for love's sake no noble gesture, all symbols, no limbs, nobody's all soul, oh, oh Kama, only can you have no use for the Kama Sutra, asses have no posture. You will find that there goes a story uh, that once upon a time Kamadeva, the love god, the Indian love god, uh, Kamadeva actually because he wanted to disturb the Lord Shiva, he was actually punished and he was burned. So when he was burned, when he was burned, what happened? Kamadeva's wife Rati actually came with so many implorations. And all these implorations were to make Kamadeva alive. And then uh, the, the God said that now Kam, Kama will be alive in everyone's heart, in everyone's body. And this was also done because of Lord Indra, you know, who actually wanted to create a desire in Lord Shiva, who was actually busy in a sort of penance. Because uh, see, he, he Parvati wanted to marry Lord Shiva, and but then he was so much involved in his penance that he had no attraction. Uh, and you know, the God had so designed uh, that one of the demons had to be killed, and that only could have been killed if Parvati could have bore a son named Kartikeya. And it was Kartikeya who later on uh, killed. Tarkasura who was actually a demon. So we find uh, that even relations is full of many Hindu poems which actually talk about uh, the rituals in mythical form and content and they also uh, talk of truth and non-violence. There are also poems in the name of Lord Murugan or uh, Lord Siva that we call. This can be considered to be a sort of submission by uh, the poet. You know the poet A. K. Ramanujan was not only struggling, but he was in a sort of conflict and his Indian uh, you know roots always called him back, he was always attracted to it. But then there are times when he feels a sort of rebellious idea, but there are times when he feels uh, that he could also uh, be submissive. This poem, Prayers to Lord Murugana, uh, was uh, also recited at the funeral of A. K. Ramanujan in Chicago. We can have some lines uh, to see how the poet also be believed that it is only the submission that only can uh, bring a sort of salvation. We can take some of the lines. Lord of the six sense, give us back our five senses. Lord of solutions, teach us to dissolve and not drown. Deliver us, O Prajans, 
from proxies and absences, from Sanskrit and the mythologies of night and the several round table mornings of London and return, the future to what it was. Lord of the lost born, give us birth. Lord of lost travelers, find us, hunt us. See the lines, find us, hunt us, return us, give us back. All these in a way symbolize the poet's ponsa for his return to his own homeland. Lord of answers, cure us at once of prayers. Fine. So, this has also been taken from relations and this poem was also reci recited at his uh, funeral. So, there is actually a note of submission, there is a note of surrender, there is a note of imploration, there is a note uh, uh, where the poet actually believes that it is only the Lord uh, Siva or the Muragun, uh, Lord Muragun is actually a Lord of youth, beauty, no? uh, joy and everything. So, let the Lord bless us with all these. I mean, as I have been saying that A.K. Ramanujan was not confined only to one theme. He also had his eye on the suffering of the women and there are end number of poems which have been dedicated to women where the poet actually uh, says uh, uh, that in order to understand, in order to know what is poetry, you should actually render meaning to it the way meanings can be given to women and if you really want to have good poetry, you also should think of the women's plights, the women's suffering, the archetypal suffering that they are suffering from. And then uh, some of the lines which are very meaningful in this regard, poems are not even words enough to rankle, infect or make the smallest incisions unless wife, girl, friend or sister and I am not talking of strangers. So, the poet says that India is a country of traditions no doubt, but then why should women only be the sufferers? He had seen you know the traditional marriages and all, how, how the women only uh, could be the second sex or the things of exploitation or abuse even in their own family members. So, through this the poet actually wants to encourage and rage others to say somehow are made to think it is all about their same in the market or an elegy on the death of a far off cousin. So, if you really want to write good poetry, please bring in your own poetry some compassion for women, so that they can come out of this suffering, not from one, but from others also. The poem is titled, Any Cow's Horn Can Do It and it is from Relations. We can also uh, take some other collections, you know, in, in a very uh, cursory manner because the time is always at our back. My dear friends, we often find uh, uh, that uh, Ramanujan's uh, poems are not only soaked in Indian sensibility, rather we also find that his poems actually uh, tell us some of the saddest, cruelest fact that many of us often uh, cannot fail to realize and this not only as an Indian, because you know Ramanujan was not a poet, not such a poet who simply was confined to Indian memories or Indian experiences. Rather, what we find is that even when he was in USA, because I have always uh, already been saying that uh, Ramanujan transcended transcended from what he had lost. But even in America, even in Chicago where he was working, we could find that Ramanujan had grown a sense of alienation. And this can be uh, justified and this can be attested to in one of the poems of the second sight, uh, one of his another collections, where he as a poet, he narrates one episode which is very important and that he later on composes in the form of a poem. And, and uh, the, uh, the episode is that he suddenly found a person who was actually throwing away from his car only the female dresses, only the female dresses. And he stopped and then the poet stopped and then could find so, and, and he later on, he actually narrates it in the form of a poem and he says, had he stripped not only hat and blouse, shoes and panties and bra, had he said maybe even the woman 
he was wearing or was it me malting shedding vestiges old investments rushing forever towards a perfect coupling with naked clothing in a world without places my difference even though this poem has been written in the context of a man throwing female dresses and to his surprise when he went near the car he could found that there was he could find that there was only one person one male in the car and when he found these things being thrown away from the car he actually links it to his own identity and he puts himself in the position of the dresses and he finds himself that he is also such a discarded one so this feeling of alienation is not confined only being an indian but this feeling of alienation can also be found because ramanujan had been traveling from one country to another one place to another and this had become a universal phenomenon my dear friend in the same uh, light we can take another uh, uh, poem which is also uh, based on uh, his experiences of chicago fine where he says and and this is uh, not a feeling which can be considered to be a native sort of feeling rather this is a feeling which has actually got the tinge of universal alienation and in that poem what he says is really of quite importance and very brilliantly he says now you know what you always knew i now you know what you always knew the country cannot be reached by jet nor by boat on a jungle river hasis behind the monkey temple nor moon sought to the cratered sea of tranquility i mean if you think of are uh, this problem being confined only to one reason no this is actually prevalent everywhere this growing sense of you know awareness this growing sense of the search for his own identity and then you cannot see it that now you know what you always knew it has already been a proven fact that once you are in a different country you can always come across this growing sense of alienation my dear friend this collection is entitled second sight and the second sight we can find again there is a mention of hindu myths gods and legends and all but then there are three poems which actually are worth mention here they are no amnesai king it is actually a tale of dushyant and sakuntala many of you might be familiar that once upon a time uh, uh, king dushyant was not able to recognize sakuntala because sakuntala had come back after bathing and she had lost her ring so the king could not recognize the king had forgotten fine and uh, the king could not recognize finally when he asked where is your ring and and the lady said that i lost it finally the fisherman could bring the uh, fish and the fi and the belly of the fish was cut and uh, the ring was recovered and then sakuntala uh, could be united uh, with uh, uh, dushyant the another is about parikshit and uh, janme jaya it is called a minor sacrifice where again uh, the poet talks about how is simply in the name of a sacrifice we actually uh, create a sort of harm to many animals fine and and even to snakes here again there is a question of snakes the uh, the uh, king parikshit was bit by snake and janme jaya decided that he will actually terminate the entire race of a snake and one you know one was not uh, to be distracted and that was uh, takchak as you might have uh, remembered and then this yagna which janmejia had started this actually was with a bow that all the snakes of the world will be terminated forever then there comes uh, another poem entitled the difference where it is said that once upon a time king moradwaj who was known for his own generosity so once god wanted to test his generosity and that is why uh, the uh, god i mean uh, lord vishnu uh, said uh, you can ask for any you know you can ask for any uh, anything fine and uh, the and and you know the god was disguised as a bamun you know as a dwarf and said i simply want three steps and in these three steps he has measured the entire world you know from the heaven to the hell from the heaven to the earth now the king moradwaj was surprised and then what should he do but still you know 
still Lord Vishnu was not satisfied. He had come on a lion and said, now you have still one thing to do because my lion is hungry and he can only eat the fresh flesh of your son. And the king and the queen, you're speechless. And they decided to cut their son into two half and offer it to Lord Vishnu. While they, were, while they started to do it, Lord Vishnu then appeared and granted, you know, all blessings uh, to uh, King Moradhuja. My dear friends, you can always uh, uh, understand uh, that the entire uh, mythological stories, they have a message and A.K. Ramanujan in his own capacity has tried to revive. Many people call him a sort of revivalist. But then through this, he was actually trying not only to awaken people, but he was also trying to answer some of the relevant questions. One poem from the second site, which is a bit more philosophical, where he says, and there is actually a dig on Hindu, where he says, as we enter the dark, someone says from behind, you are a Hindu, aren't you? You must have second sight. I fumble in my nine pockets like the night blind, son-in-law groping in every room for his wife, and strike a light to regain at once my first and my only sight. I simply want to have my only sight, that is my first sight. And the first sight is what? The first sight is my Indian origin, my Indian belonging. There are stories and stories which are embedded in and A.K. Ramanujan is not an exception. Another, there are some stories from Panchatantra which have also been given a due wettage uh, in uh, his uh, poetry collection where uh, the poet actually talks about uh, three Brahmi, uh, four Brahmins who actually wanted to, because they were very proud of their mantras and with their mantras they wanted to resuscitate a dead tiger. No? a dead tiger and you know what happened when it was proved when it was done all all three of them were killed there was another uh, uh, there was the fifth one who was actually not that knowledgeable but he had common sense and he climbed a tree and he was just kept so on that the poet says but today out of the blue when Vishnu came to mind, the dark one you know who began as a dwarf and rose in the world to measure heaven and earth with his paces. This is actually uh, a reference to uh, that King, uh, reference to that King Moradvaja's and Lord Vishnu's story. Then I can tell you n number of stories that have been dealt by uh, A.K. Ramanujan in one or the other uh, poetry collections. The last one which came out after his death, that is posthumously, was Black Hen, where uh, again there are mythological stories about Putna and Krishna. You are all familiar with how uh, Kans wanted to uh, get Krishna killed and that is why he had sent a sea demon in the form of Putna. Uh, and while sucking the milk of Putna, uh, Putna had actually to uh, get herself killed because uh, she spurted blood uh, the way Krishna uh, sucked her. And then uh, there is another story about uh, Hiran Kashyap and Lord Vishnu. So, where uh, Hiran Kashyap also because of his own atrocities, you know, he only wanted that he should rule the entire world and nobody should kill him. And he had taken, you know, a very mischievously a boon from uh, the Lord. But the Lord knew it all that he was not to be trusted. And when all his atrocities were at the height, the Lord appeared and then uh, Hiran Kashyap was killed. There is one more uh, that is about a young female uh, who is a supporter or who is a devotee of Lord uh, Vishnu. So here what happens is, it, it, now there is a reference of all Indian women who actually are being perturbed, who actually are being exploited by their husband, where this lady did not want to grant the advances of her own husband. And every now and then while being in bed, she used to say, Om, Om, Om. And once when the man tried to uh, uh, have a sort of, you know, take a sort of undue advantage, the women actually, uh, through her own hands, she actually tried to flee that man. Now, in order to do that, there is actually a power that A.K. Ramanujan wants to put a, even among women. I have already mentioned that how the three Brahmins who were proud of their knowledge, how they wanted to bring uh, to life the dead uh, lion and how the lion killed them. But one who had a common sense who climbed the tree. 
And you know what the poet actually tries to say through this was, poetry too is a tigress, poetry has got more power, except there is no fifth man. Who is this fifth man? This fifth man is a man with a common sense, left on a tree, whence he takes your breath. So, when you are writing poetry, poetry also is a tigress, except there is no fifth man. Poetry is innocent, poetry is powerful. You have to find, you actually have to amalgamate the balance between the two, my dear friend, and that, that is how poetry can survive. Now, there can be a uh, end number of poems to be discussed when we talk about uh, A.K. Ramanujan or Atipatta Krishna Swami Ramanujan, but since time is not on our side, we will have to finally assess the works of A.K. Ramanujan and here we can take the views of some of the critics who say, because there are charges and charges on A.K. Ramanujan. Many people say that his poems are simply soaked in, I know, family associations, memories, rituals and all, to which Bruce King has given uh, a proper response. And the response is that these are, and not only Bruce King, there have also been other people who say that his Indian experiences can be considered to be a sort of autochthonous, autochthonous, no? Meaning thereby, there is a sort of indigenousness, indigenousness, autochthonousness. So, indigenousness, nativity. And you know, what is the harm if our poets are singing the nativity songs? So, Ramanujan is not a nostalgic traditionalist nor an advocate of modernization and westernization. He is actually a product of both and his poems reflect a personality conscious of change. It is not that he is steeped in, but he actually wants a change as well, enjoying its vitality, freedom and contradictions but also aware of memories which from his inner self, memories of an unconscious namelessness which are still alive at the foundation of self. These are the remarks of Bruce King. We can also take the remark of Mehrotra who considered uh, A.K. Ramanujan to be a magician uh, and he says like tricky Chinese boxes, A.K. Ramanujan's poems are difficult to open but of exquisite workmanship. He always, you know, since he was a translator now, he always wanted to revise his poems at times. They are objects to hold between fingers and uh, as, as much as they are printed lines to read with the eyes. One last remark that I am tempted to take is by uh, Harimohan Prashad who says, Though Ramanujan was an expatriate academician, expatriate academician, still he was, he was, you know, when he died, he was there in Chicago, teaching linguistics in Chicago, the Indian sensibility and experience was deeply rooted in him. He retained an unfractured, unfractured Indian spirit. And that is why he is to be considered one of the major voices and of all the voices that we have read so far. His voice can be considered to be the most, uh, most promising voice of Indian English poetry. Before we conclude, we can also draw certain findings. Ramanujan's poetry actually builds bridges between the East and the West. He was not only simply because some of his poems are also about American life and all, fine. Of course, his poems are rooted in Indian sensibility. There is an abundant use of tales, myths, mores and epics annexing him to his roots. His language originates with existential, philosophical and scientific concerns. Of course, he is critical of certain stigmas of his culture, yet he does not want to unlearn conventions of despair. So, this convincence of despair, he did not want to unlearn, even though there were despair, but he actually found a sort of triumph in this despair. Straddling all, all bit between two cultures, Ramanujan's muse globalizes Indian myths, cultures, beliefs, superstitions and religions. And to sum up, 
Let us take some lines of Ramanujan and that actually will provide a quintessence of all that Ramanujan was striving towards. Where are you? I am home. I am hungry. But there was no answer, not even an echo. In the deserted street, blazing with sunshine. So here there is a reference to his stay uh, outside. In the deserted street, blazing with sunshine, suddenly he remembered he was now 61 and he had not a mother for 40 years. And the poem is from returning. So, and, and you know, you will be surprised to know that when he was 61, even then he felt that he had not a mother for 40 years. These 40 years are the years that he spent in Chicago. My dear friends, Ramanujan left uh, this world at the age of 64. Fine. So, to, to sum up, we can say that Ramanujan was such a poet who straddled between two cultures, but yet he was intact and his psyche was ingrained, soaked in Indian sensibility, but then he was towards a change, a change for betterment, a change for authenticity, a change for poetic beliefs, a change for what man has done to man, a change for what geography has distanced us, a change for what history is a witness to. With these words, let me come to the end of this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.